you know that uh, when we go to heaven, we're going to serve the Lord? I don't know if you knew that. Some of you might think we're just going to kick back on lazy boys on a cloud, but no, we're actually going to serve God. And so while we're here on earth, we need to kind of get ready for that by serving together, serving each other and meeting each other's needs. And so we're going to look at the at that this morning. Um, So I said, when we get to heaven, we're going to serve God. What does that look like? Well, here on earth, it looks like serving people, meeting people's needs. And when you take your resources and your abilities and, and you encourage others, you know what you're doing? You're doing what the Bible calls ministry. When you meet a need, when you assist somebody, when you help them with the talents that you have, with the resources that you have, the Bible calls that ministry. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Boy, if the church could do that, huh? Agree wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. There's a dynamic that takes place. It's a spiritual dynamic. When men and women of God come together and they work together on on anything, if they have that single purpose that God has led them to do something, and they stay on that, it's amazing what we can accomplish. It really is remarkable. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, How do you do that? How do you accomplish things? How do you work together um, with one heart and one purpose? And you might be thinking, well, why do I need to work with other people? I'm pretty good doing things myself. And uh, here's why. Number one, we're family. Uh, Weeks ago, I shared with you that there's two families. There's a spiritual family and there's a physical family. You were born into a physical family. But there's a spiritual family. And many times, you're closer to your spiritual family than you are with your physical family. That's not always the case. But we, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have that dynamic. We have a a physical family, and we also have a spiritual family. And let me tell you, when your physical family is part of the spiritual family, folks, that's good news, isn't it? That's, That's really good news. And so... The Bible often compares ministry, serving together, meeting each other's needs, with with gardening. And I love gardening. Uh, Paul tells us something about gardening in 1 Corinthians 3.8. He says, the one who plants and the one who waters work as a team with the same purpose. So some of you are really good at at introducing yourselves and starting a relationship. Uh, others are good at, at, at leading people to Christ. Others are, are very good with hospitality. Others are more comfortable in a, a group. But there's just all different kinds of dynamics and personalities going on. But it's all similar to guarding. There's all aspects of that. I like what Rick Warren says. He says, the fastest way to get a small group close to each other is by serving together. It, it's not by socializing, and it's not even by studying, which... It's kind of an interesting statement. It's by serving together. When you get together, it builds a team. Now, studying the Word of God, I believe, is really important. I mean, if you love something, you're going to spend time with whatever that is, right? Whether it's a hobby or a spouse. Now, listen, if you love the Lord, you want to spend time with the Lord to grow in the things of the Lord. So that makes sense. But we, as a family, a spiritual family, I believe we grow deeper and stronger as we grow together. So what does it look like to to build a team? And I'm using the word team. I'm going to use the word team and break that down each letter. And what I'm talking about is what many of you have referred to as like the army of God. Did you know if you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you're part of the army of God? You're enlisted in an, a spiritual army, and we're a team, and we work together. And so I'm going to break it down. The T in team 
stands for trust. You got that? It stands for trust. Trust is the emotional glue that draws you and I closer together as friends, as family, even in a small group. You've, you've got to have trust. Without trust, you're never going to have the intimate relationships that, that God has intended for us. And so, it's the emotional glue. Trust is the emotional glue that, that creates team, whether that team is a team of husband and wife, uh, a Bible study team. Folks, what I'm sharing with you right now, it's in the context of, of Christianity. It's in the context of ministry, and I break it down even into the context of your small groups that I'm hoping you're all plugged into. Um, but this stuff that I'm sharing, these biblical principles, when I say stuff, I'm talking about biblical principles. It works in marriages. It works at work. It works in school. These are principles that work even if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Biblical, biblical principles work. It's an amazing thing. They're powerful. God created them. And so trust is the emotional glue and, uh, that allows us to work together. Did you know uh, Paul, the apostle, and more importantly, Jesus uh, functioned in a team with others? It was rare to see them go off and do anything uh, solo. Uh, and I, I believe because of that and the evidence that we have in Scripture of them working with others and building teams and disciples, and I believe that's a model for all of us. First Timothy 6.20 is in your notes. By the way, some of you, you can follow uh, our church app, and you can um, follow along with the notes right now if you'd like. 1 Timothy 6.20 says, Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. The Apostle Paul's encouraging the individual that he's mentoring, Timothy, and he's saying, Timothy, guard what God has entrusted. Uh, entrust is, is trust. You have to a responsibility. You have to share responsibility. You have to share responsibility. One of my favorite sports is football. And not all sports are team in, in the sense that football is, okay? There, there are solo type of sports, wrestling and fighting, but they're part of a team as well, if you look at the bigger picture. But I love football. And if, if you like football like me, you'll notice that they have a quarterback. And the quarterback's objective is to get rid of the ball. Ideally, to pass it to an open receiver, right? To score a touchdown or hand off to a, a running back to run a play for a touchdown. But the goal is to get touchdowns. The goal is to, for the quarterback to get rid of the ball. If he hangs on to the ball, he's not going to get too far. The team's not going to score any points. And... And the reason I bring that up is in the context of ministry, in small groups, in the context of your marriage, or anything that you do, I think it's important to recognize people that are gifted, that demonstrate some abilities, and then start handing the ball off to them or pass the ball to them. I want to encourage some of you that are in Bible studies or wherever you're at, uh, look for individuals that demonstrate a love for the Word, a love for the Lord, and, and start giving them empowerment to maybe share and do things like that and hand the ball off. I remember when we started the ministry back in 1994, we planted Eagle Ridge Church here in Menifee, and I was the senior pastor, I was the worship leader, I was the youth pastor, I mean, my wife was the children's director, the women's ministry director, and everything else. Whatever I didn't do, she did, and whatever she didn't do, I did, okay? We did it all, and it, it was in the infant stages of the church, and we kind of had to do that way, but we, we would pray, God, send leaders, Lord. Send somebody with a pulse that'll help us. We need some help, and, uh, and lo and behold, the Lord did, and we began to hand things off. You know, there were some things I handed off that I, I really had a hard time handing off. Hey, you know what I'm talking about? Things that you love to do. I remember the Lord pounding my heart and telling me, and I'm kind of hard-headed, so I don't um, listen real quick sometimes. But the Lord was telling me in real 
very clear to hand off the music ministry. And uh, I had a hard time doing that, you know. I just enjoyed it. But, but I did, and when I did, God just brought all kinds of musicians and way better than me. And, uh, and, and it just blossomed. It just blossomed. So it's interesting, even the things that you enjoy doing, as you hand them off and you empower people, you're adding to the kingdom. You're, you're adding laborers, and you'll see that God fills in the gaps, and, and he won't leave you alone. He'll give you something else. He's guiding and he's directing you. Proverbs 20 Verse 6 says, many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? You know, this was written thousands of years ago, and it's the same human dilemma today. How do you become trustworthy? How can you become a trustworthy person that people can trust? And, And obviously, it's right there. It's being reliable. So as you hand things off, and you empower people, you want to make sure that you empower people that are reliable. I want to talk about that. Uh, You can earn people's trust by being consistent. Being consistent. If there's a task and you know the timetable and, 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 and you know what's required, be consistent. When you're consistent, those in the group that love you and those that are leaders, they'll trust you because you're consistent. Uh, character, character, I don't necessarily, necessarily believe, is built on the big things that we do. It's the little things that we're consistent and we're reliable. It's the little things. And, and God's Word tells us if we're consistent and we're reliable in the little things, in the little things... He's going to bless us with the big things. That's what it says in God's Word. That's a biblical principle. So another dynamic that uh, we can embrace is being confidential. We are a church that has a lot of small groups. We have Bible studies, home fellowship groups. We call them nest groups. They're not all called nest groups. Some of them are, we have men's Bible studies. We have uh, women's Bible studies. We have different groups that meet prayer meetings, but they're small groups. Even on Thursday night with Celebrate Recovery, they break up after their big group like this, they break up into small groups, and they minister and meet each other's needs. Uh, And a dynamic that is so important when you're around people is to be confidential. Uh, People trust when you can keep a secret. Proverbs 11.13 says, A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Keep a confidence. And you know what gossip is? You know what gossip is? Gossip is when you share information and you're not part of the problem or the solution. And you can form that in any fashion that you want and say, Hey, I, I have this prayer request. You see, Joe over there, he, uh, he did this, that, and the other thing. And I, th- I think we need to pray for Joe, man, or John, or Steve, or whoever that is. That's gossip. You're not, part, you're not part of the solution. You're not part of the problem. And this may be a wake-up call to some of you, what I'm about to say. But if you have friends, hopefully you're not this person, but if you have friends that uh, talk about other people to you, I guarantee you they talk about you to other people. That might be a wake-up call. And here's what the Scripture says in Proverbs 20, 19. I have it on the screen. It says, a gossip can never keep a secret. Stay away from people who talk too much. So God directs us to just stay away from those people. Because if they're talking about others, as I said, I guarantee they're talking about you. So, here's my answer to gossip. You ready? In all my infinite wisdom and counseling training, you ready? This is just A-plus stuff I'm about to give you. Stop it. (laughs) Knock it off. See, I don't do much counseling. I have counselors that do most of our counseling because that's how I counsel. I'll I'll look at you and say, stop it. (laughs) Just stop it. I learned that from my dad because... I'd run up to my dad and say, Dad, when I go like this, it hurts. 
Where does it hurt? Right there. He goes, well, don't go like that. <laughs> okay. Just stop it. Okay. To earn trust, you've got to spend time with people. You, you just have to spend time pe- with people. You don't trust people you don't know. You don't. Proverbs 17, 17 says, friends love through all kinds of weather. Friend, that takes time because we live a life of ups and downs. We don't. We all do. And so we've got to spend time with people and we've got to be there through the ups and downs. That takes time. Look what it says. It says, and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. Families should stick together. Both the physical family and the spiritual family. So if you want people to trust you, you've got to spend time with them. You just have to spend time with them. Time creates trust, and trust takes time. Either way, it takes time to build trust. Did you catch that? Okay, the second key to being a part of the army of God, being in a team, whether that's a a husband, a wife team, business, at work, more importantly, in a small group or church, is enlarging. The E stands for enlarging. People always love and admire individuals who help them go to the next level. Someone who enlarges them and empowers them to be successful. We love people like that. You want to be around individuals that, that uh, empower you, enlarge you. If you want to be an enlarger, you're adding value to people. Here's how you do it. Be an initiator. Don't be somebody that says, you know, I, I don't have any friends. And, and you have to be friendly. Go introduce yourself uh, to somebody. Make an encounter. Be an initiator. Encourage someone. You might feel like, well, no, nobody gives me affirmation. Nobody, and that may be true. And nobody gives me encouragement. Be an initiator. And you might be thinking this as well. Why do I always have to be an initiator? Just do it. And, and, and it'll spread. People will see the goodness of it. And it's the light of Jesus shining through you. And they're going to want to be like you. Because you're, you're, you're an enlarger. You're, you're empowering people. You're encouraging them. Um, so be an initiator in this. Uh, serve others before they serve you. Well, I didn't get a bulletin today. <laughs> they didn't do this. They didn't do that. No, no, no. Serve others. How can you help? We'll get to that in a minute. Add value to, <laughs> add value to, to others before they add value to you. Add value. Look for a reason to tell somebody how awesome they are. Amen? Amen. By the way, you guys are awesome. (laughs) Here's a basic truth. I believe. I've experienced this. We're drawn to people that are encouragers, that empower, that enlarge us. We're drawn to that. We stay clear. You stay clear of individuals who are negative. They're always pointing out faults that are not fun to be around. That's just truth. I'm speaking truth right now. You can change and be somebody who enlarges others to be an encourager. Amen? Say, I can do it. I know you can. The third key to being a a team, and listen, we're a team. If Christ is in your heart, we're part of a team. If Christ is kind of in your heart, get with the team, man. Just get with it. We're, part, we're, we're, we're in this together. The third key is the A, and it's accommodation. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.22. It says, be faithful, loving, and easy to get along with. Is that you? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> be faithful, loving, and easy to get along with. You may not be that, or you may not feel that way, or others, you may feel like others don't feel that about you, but... You can start today. You can start today by being loving and faithful and easy to get along with. Romans 12, 18 says this, do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as you possibly can. Do your best to live at peace. There's a number of different ways that we can accommodate each other. You ready? Here we go. 
We can accommodate each other's needs. We can accommodate each other's needs. In your notes, Romans 15, 2 says, each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Friends, I think that's a great question to ask people. How can I help? How can I help? I think we should do a lot of listening, and then when it's appropriate to talk, to say, well, how can I help? How can I help? I, I, that's a great question. We can accommodate people by accommodating their ideas. There are individuals that say it's my way or the highway. But listen, we ought to be open to other people's ideas. Proverbs 18, 15 says, the intelligent man or woman is always open to new ideas. In fact, he or she looks for them. Don't be intimidated by new ideas. As long as they're in alignment with God's Word, we can ac accommodate each other by accommodating each other's personalities. Have you ever noticed that we don't all have the same personality? I'm going to say something. I hope it doesn't, well, it probably will, step on some toes. But have you ever noticed, don't raise your hand, have you ever noticed that the individuals that you have the most hard time with are a lot like you? <laughs> Ooh, I went there, didn't I? But that seems to be true. But we can, we can accommodate each other by uh, just making graces for the different personalities. There's different personalities. Romans 12, 6 says, God in His kindness gave each of us different gifts. And with those gifts, different gifts, they're different abilities, uh, different personalities. Uh, it all boils down, I think, and I, don't, I have a tendency to try and simplify everything. I just like to understand things in a simple way. And I think there's probably four different personalities. There might be more, but, and I wrote them down. Can I share them with you? Here we go. There's the person who wants to work and get things done. They're goal-oriented. They just, they just want to work and get things done. And I think those are great people, don't you? They, they, they're workers, and they just want to get things done. And they set goals, and, and they achieve those goals. There's the person who wants to have fun and enjoy life. They might work hard. They work hard. But their focus is enjoying life. That's me, by the way. <laughs> I, hey, listen, if I'm going to do this thing called life, we might as well have fun doing it. Amen? You know, too many Christians are, um, how do I say this nicely? You're, you're, they're sour. It's like they just sucked on a lemon, you know? It's like, mm, and there's no fun. It's no fun. Listen, being a Christian is fun. And we should have fun and enjoy the things, God's goodness. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not serious. You've seen me get serious once in a great while. But uh, listen, we should have fun as believers, right? Okay. Then there's the person who wants to think and discuss things and really gets into things. And I love people like that. They're, they like to process and they love uh, structures and procedures, and they really think deeply about each thing, and they think it through, you know, where I'm like, I'll just jump in, let's do this, yeah, and they were like, wait, 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 there's quicksand right there, oh, yeah, you're right, okay, I love people that think things through, then there's that person who just wants to make sure that all the relationships are good, and there's peace in the relationships, in any situation, they're going to see these, you're going to see these personalities come out, and we need all these different personalities, to make it work. God created us all differently. Here we go. To accommodate people, we've got to accommodate their faults. Here's something for you. Have you ever, when, you know, when you first met that person and you fell in love with them? They were perfect, weren't they? It's like, oh God, this, oh. Uh, when you went to that church, that, you know that the first time you went there, it was perfect, right? That Bible study, oh, these people are awesome. They're so mature. This is a perfect Bible study. A couple weeks later, man, these people are messed up. <laughs> what was I thinking? Why did I marry him or her? 
What was I thinking? You see, we have to accommodate each other's faults. There's a couple ways you can do that. Can I offer some suggestions? You can fake it till you make it, right? You can pretend that everybody's perfect and think that you're perfect. I don't think that works. Uh, you can leave it. You can leave the oh, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find another church. I'm going to find another Bible study. I'm going to find another spouse. I'm going to find another vehicle, you know. It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, by the way. We're broken. We're, we are people that are broken. We're all broken. And we're going to be perfect one day when we stand before the Lord. But until then, we're flawed. You might be saying, well, you know, some people are more flawed than others. Hey, we're all flawed. We're all flawed. So you can accept that and extend grace to yourself because you're flawed and to others. And none of us are perfect. And that's accommodation, just saying, you know what? These are people, and they have good days. They have tough days. And, you know, as you get to know people, they put their guard down, and you really start to see who they really are the goodness, and the flaws. And you just accept that. Thank God God accepts us in His Son, Jesus Christ. And He took on all our flaws and sins on the cross. But one day, one day we're going to stand before the Lord. We'll have a perfect body. Amen? No, no pain, no hurts. There's not going to be any sorrow in heaven. And to have that day that I just described requires that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to close with this. The M in team is mission. To have a team, you've got to have a cause. You have to have purpose. That's a cause. That's a mission. You've got to have purpose. Why do you meet? Why do you meet? Why do you do what you do? You've got to have a cause. You've got to have a, you have to have a purpose. That's a mission. Teams do not just exist for themselves. They have to have a reason. They've got to do something together. I mean, you could study the Word of God till Jesus comes back, but when are you going to live the Word of God? You've got to have a purpose. Jesus said to go. Jesus said to tell everybody the good news. Jesus said that. When the church does that, we're going to be dynamic. When I say the church, I'm talking about all believers everywhere on planet Earth. When the church accepts the fact that we, are, we have the responsibility to tell people the good news. The good news is good because there's really, really bad news. That's why the good news is so good. The bad news, can I share the bad news? The bad news is every single person who doesn't have Christ in their heart When they die, they will spend eternity in hell. The Bible talks about hell more than just about anything else, and it talks about it graphically and describes what hell will be like. Individuals that don't have Christ in their heart, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, you will spend eternity in hell. Folks, I told you every once in a while I get serious, and here we go. This is serious stuff. That is very bad news. It's not being somebody who has a faith. It's not being somebody who says or feels that they're a good person. That's not good enough. There's only one name, tells us in the book of Acts, upon which a person could be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. That's why the good news is so good. The good news is God loves you. God loves you. Right where you're at, no matter what you've done, God loves you so much that He sent His Son Jesus over 2,000 years ago. And Jesus died on the cross, and Jesus took on all of our sin. All of it. He died. They buried Him. He rose from the grave. We celebrated that. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive right now. He's more alive now than ever. 
And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you can feel that he's alive within you. That's the Holy Spirit within you. God abides within you. Jesus is here, and he's alive. We celebrate that every Sunday. That's why we have church. It's the Lord's Day. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I started the service off by saying, God's created us, and I've said this every week, God's created us for community. It's not good that man be alone, but God created us for community. More importantly, God created you and desires that you have fellowship with him. And when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have to fret or worry about death. God takes the fear of death away because of the forward look to heaven that's awaiting you. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this morning. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, doesn't have a relationship with you, Jesus, if there's someone here who maybe they have had a relationship with you, but it's not a real relationship right now, and they need to reconnect and recommit to you, God, I pray that this morning, this morning is a new beginning for them. The Holy Spirit and God's tug, tugging at your heart right now to give your heart to Jesus Christ, to receive the forgiveness of sins that he's made available to you, or you feel it's time to rededicate your life to the Lord, I want you to raise your hand high so I can see it. Raise it high. We're going to pray in a moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise it up high so I can see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Church, we're going to pray right now. If you raised your hand, even if you didn't raise your hand, and you know you should have, it's okay. Pray this prayer, but pray it out loud. In fact, I'd like everyone to pray with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the grave on the third day. I ask you right now, Jesus, be my Lord. Be my Savior. Holy Spirit, fill me to overflowing. Guide me in this journey. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand? Praise God. Amen. Listen, if you accepted Christ for the first time or rededicated your life to the Lord, we've got some materials we'd like to give you. Let Pastor John know he'll be at the Visitor Center. And uh, if you need a Bible, we've got Bibles to give, but we'd like to help you out. If you made a commitment to the Lord this morning, fill that out on your connection card. Pastor Rick's going to share how to do that in just a moment. But I want to just say one more thing. We've got some time. Years ago, my family, we went up to the Redwoods. How many of you have been up to the Redwoods in California up north? Almost everybody. If you haven't been up there, it would be well worth it to go up there. It's magnificent. The Redwood Forest in California. It's just amazing to me that it's in California, and it's amazing to me that they're the tallest trees on the planet. Did you know that? They're the tr tallest trees on the planet. I'm amazed at how large they are. In fact, we have a picture. Um, Sarah, you remember that picture where we drove through the tree? We have a picture of the whole family, and, and they actually carved out one of the Redwoods, and you could drive through it. We have a picture of that. It's just amazing. It's just, wow, and, and the beauty, and you walk through the redwoods and the ferns and just that canopy. But you know what really struck me as amazing? It's when I found out that redwood trees, the tallest trees on the planet, their root system is very shallow. You would think a tree that tall would be, have a very deep root system, but it's very shallow. And redwood trees, they grow in groves. It's of necessity that they do because that's what holds them up. 
their root system intertwines with the other trees around them in the grove. And that's what allows the tallest tree on the planet to be able to stand. To me, that's such a beautiful picture of why we need each other. We need to stand together, arm in arm, and, and, and function together in ministry and in family. Amen? Take that home and think about it.